Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the uh, October 20th meeting of the California High Speed Rail Authority's Board of Directors. Thank you for coming. And uh, if we could ask the uh, Secretary to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Shank? Chair Richards? Here. Director Camacho? Here. Vice Chair Miller? Here. Assemblymember Arambula? Here. Director Preya? Here. Director Gilmetti? Here. Director Escutia? Here. Director Williams? Here. Director Pena? Here. Senator Gonzalez? Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. If we uh, could uh, stand and we've got a flag up, and if we could ask Director Shank to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you, uh, Director Shank. And if uh, I could start the meeting with uh, just a quick comment. Um, I'm uh, both happy and sad to uh, report to everyone and the people in the public that our secretary has um, been offered an opportunity to move forward. Unfortunately, it's not with the high-speed rail, and we'll miss him. But uh, we wish him well. And, Mo, if you could uh, come, uh, come over here and just stand. Uh, with us. Are we making him sit down? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me just read this. This is to Mormon Ramadan, Wednesday, October 26th. This is October the 20th. Oh, the 26th is your last day. <laughs> Mo, thank you for all, you, all your hard work and the dedication in helping us build the nation's first high-speed rail system. Through your contribution to Strategic Communications and the Board of Directors, directors you have been the ticket to our success. <laughs> We wish you the best in your future endeavors. And from the Board of Directors and all the management and staff of High Speed Rail, your ticket. Thank you, Mr. And may I also have the record uh, reflect that uh, it, it would be the direction of this board, it would be the direction of this board that on the first train with paying passengers on board, your, you and your family would be offered free tickets that you said to Bakersfield and back. You can't be up in the cab, though. That's where Lynn Shank will be. Or my coffin, one or the other. I don't acknowledge that. <laughs> Thank you again, Mo. With that, uh, we will um, move to public comment and ask our secretary to advise the public how they can address us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, all. Before we begin public comment for the California High Speed Rail Board of Directors meeting, I would like to go over some important information. For our board members joining remotely, over the teleconference line, please be cognizant that the audio can be picked up in the speakers and the host cannot mute you. For members of the public who have joined us in person and wish to provide public comment, you will be called in the order that we have received your card. Please slowly and clearly say and spell your first and last name, and if applicable, state the organization you represent. Public comment is limited to two minutes, unless directed otherwise. We are also allowing members of the public to provide remote public comment by telephone after in-person public comment. If you are on the phone and wish to provide public comment, please, please press 1 and 0, and that will put you into the queue. 
We will start with in-person public comment for David Schwegel. David Schwegel. Mr. Schwegel, good morning. Good morning, Board of Directors. This is David, D-A-V-I-D, Schwegel, S-C-H-W-E-G-E-L, spelled like Schwegel, Reinfeldt Bagel. I haven't started my own engineering firm, but if I do, it'll be called Bagel Engineering Services because my name rhymes with bagel. This public comment is dedicated to Joe Hedges. Joe, I used to live in the state of Washington, and I thank you so much for your valuable service. You were uh, at the top of the food chain back during the 11 weeks. I was the change order manager for High Speed Rail CP23. And under your leadership, you inspired me to orchestrate the efforts of my change management team to put together this change order manager's manual, which I'll be leaving with Mo once I'm done here. Uh, there was an incentive for including an article on Cascadia because the Washington State Civil PE stamp is uh, really cool looking. It's got a silhouette of George Washington. For those of you who have driven the state of Washington, you'll notice that the state shield is a silhouette of George Washington. I'd like to pose a challenge to the public. Here's the question. How can low rock bottom bids, like the less than a billion dollars that CP1 was bid at, become superseded by creative change order composition? I understand the latest costs now of CP1 are in the neighborhood of uh, five billion, uh, plus or minus a billion. Uh, we're starting to follow remaining. the uh, trend of the Bay Bridge here. So public is challenged to, in two minutes, explain how creative change order composition supersedes low bidding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swigel. Do we have anybody else for public comment in person? If you wish to provide public comment, please provide me your green card. If not, John, do we have anybody on the queue on our, for remote public comment? We have four queued up for phone comment. Our first caller is Brenda Vinendal with Fresno Council of Government. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Sir, good morning. Good morning to all of you. Um, this uh, comment is in regard to j agenda item four, consider awarding the contract for design services for the Central Valley Station. And on behalf of the Fresno Council of Governments, we appreciate the opportunity to offer support for the contract and to assist with input to the station design moving forward. We also look forward to working with the authority staff on any further details for this regional station that will serve not just the residents of the city of Fresno and Clovis, but our rural cities and communities as well. And we will plan to communicate openly and thoroughly with the three public transit operators and high-speed rail to address accessibility, mobility, and equity issues, as well as to address the new requirements coming online, such as EV charging facilities and all of that. Um, thank you to the High Speed Rail Authority for continuing to partner with Fresno COG, our regional public transit agencies, and jurisdictions in this very important planning endeavor. Thank you very much, and uh, please thank your members for uh, their support of High Speed Rail and Tony Bourne. Thank you. Our next caller is Frank Quintero from the City of Merced. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Chair Richards and board members. Frank Quintero, Deputy City Manager, City of Merced. I, too, am speaking on Agenda Item 4. We support staff's recommendation to bring up F&P &F and ARUP for de design services of the station. Happy to report that a week ago, High-Speed Rail, Ace Train, and Amtrak had a public information meeting, which was very positive, and the residents are looking forward to participating in this activity, moving the station forward, and there's a lot of momentum going in our direction with design services for the track between Madera to Merced and now this, so 
Uh, we again just ask you to support staff and their recommendation. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Our next caller is Sharon Gonzalez, City of Bakersfield. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, Mr. Chair um, and members of the board. Um, my name is Sharon Gonzalez. I'm with the Rennie Public Policy Group calling today on behalf of the City of Bakersfield. Also, like um, the callers prior to me speaking on agenda item four, wanted to just briefly take a moment to um, thank the authority and its planning staff for really working together with the city and facilitating the staffing necessary during the design phase. We look forward to continued discussions and opportunities to coordinate with the authority as we seek state and federal funding to adequately tie the station into the community, specifically looking to drive development and encourage economic development. So um, again, just thank you for your continued collaboration and we look forward to continuing to work with the authority. Thank you. Our last caller in queue is Beth Munez. Uh, no affiliation provided. Go ahead, please. Good morning, and thank you, everyone, for um, providing me this opportunity to speak. Uh, I recently graduated from the CVTC program in Selma, um, sponsored by the High Speed Rail, and I just wanted to talk a little bit on my experience. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity that the program provided me uh, just in general with uh, giving me options of career pathways that I really didn't uh, know that would have been possible for me. And I really uh, appreciate the program and hope that it can grow into something much larger. Uh, I think this is a good program for everybody in the Central Valley, especially uh, for people that are um, generally having trouble finding employment and uh, career opportunities. Uh, and I think it would be a great program in the future for even students in schools and just getting out of high school for them to really explore the trades and different opportunities that they may not have had the chance to look at before. Um, so again, I just want to say thank you very much for this experience that you're providing by uh, funding this program. And thank you for your time for addressing us. Thank you. John, do we have anybody in the queue? Uh, sir, the queue is clear. Mr. Chairman? Yes. This is Henry. Uh, I just Hi. wanted to follow up. Hi, how are you, everybody? I just wanted to follow up on the last speaker. Um, she was a graduate of our last training program, and she she received the highest score possible in the mathematical part of her equation, which earned her an apprenticeship opportunity with one of the building trades in in Fresno. So uh, we're glad that she was you know had the time to come on and speak because it just shows uh, the value of this uh, training program and the and the fact that it's changing lives for people who are very interested in working in the construction field and, of course, our high-speed rail project. So thank you for letting her speak. Thank you, Director Perea. Okay, that uh, then concludes our public comments today, and we'll start the agenda. Item number one is uh, the approval of our September 25th board meeting minutes. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, yeah. I need to abstain. Aye. Yes. Thank you. We have uh, one abstention, abstention with Director Gilmetti, and uh, otherwise it's unanimous. We'll now move on to item number two. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, item number two is the consider of the awarding of the contract for the project delivery support for high-speed rail. I'd like to just make a quick comment uh, as we move into this. Um, I, uh, on behalf of the board, appointed a subcommittee uh, to review uh, this procurement, specifically the, the selection. And um, that committee, uh, I would like to thank on behalf of the board and certainly myself, uh, the amount of work uh, that they was put in early on in, um, 
in their deliberations, uh, they asked for counsel. That counsel was provided. It was outside counsel. And um, so before we move into this, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Director Camacho, our directors Camacho and Gilmetti for uh, an incredible amount of work. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, with uh, how hard you invested and the commitment that you made towards this. I would like to give them an opportunity to make any comments they wish before we uh, move to uh, the staff presentation. Director Camacho. Thank this you, is Jim. the first time you've ever deferred to Ernie. <laughs> Go ahead, Ernie. Well, the chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, chairman Richards uh, formed a sub subcommittee of Jim Gilmetti and myself for the purpose of reviewing the provisions of the RFQ as it related to the conflict of interest. Um, specifically, the disclosure issues, since we had concerns about the offer's relationships with firms that were currently under contract with the authority. Uh, we required additional information uh, that uh, required a mitigation plan. The mitigation plan proposed by uh, ACOM Fleur, we feel avoid actual conflicts during the term of the PDS contract. With that commitment, I think uh, Mr. Gelmetti, Director Gelmetti, myself, and the outside legal counsel uh, we accept the staff recommendation to award the PDS contract to the joint venture of AECOM Fleur. Uh, we feel that those mitigation efforts during the term of the contract will suffice and answer the question of conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director uh, Camacho. Yes, uh, Director uh, Escusha. Yeah, I have a question to uh, Mr. Camacho, and that is how, or maybe the question is to the board, uh, to Chairman Richards and to Brian Kelly, how do we ensure that these mitigation measures are being implemented continuously? How do we ensure that? Well, it's certainly the responsibility of, of uh, management and the oversight that uh, it provides on its contracts as well as, as, well as the um, internal audit uh, committee, or staff, excuse me. Um, Beyond that, uh, I mean, that's the expectation of this board. Um, the uh, mitigation plan that was submitted uh, by the respondent, uh, AECOM Floor, is uh, specific and direct and uh, should be able to be managed uh, because it is, uh, is so. And it would be the expectation of the board that it is strictly adhered to during the, during the term of this uh, contract. That being said, I, I would certainly, any comments that uh, our CEO would like to make, uh, go ahead, Brian. I think the short answer in terms of making sure the board is satisfied that it's being implemented is uh, we can routinely report to the board where we are on it. Uh, there are elements in the recommended mitigation plan that uh, uh, are, are clear in terms of the, what we'll put in place. And as we do that, we can come back to the board and uh, report exactly where we are on each of those elements. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Uh, Director. Commission. One of the, um, well, during this process of evaluating the conflict of interest issues, we reviewed our current policies, procedures, and, and compared them to the federal and state regulations and found that perhaps we need to, to review our current policies, strengthen certain areas so that there will be no, no, um, issue about whether or not someone has to disclose. And I think perhaps uh, if we can do begin by, by reviewing our own policies, having outside counsel or our own existing counsel work with, with a committee to, to ensure that those conflict of interest issues are, uh, are strengthened. Our poli the policies are not intended to dilute the contract pool. It's in fact in, intended to, to encourage more competition. And one of the things that we're finding is that if they continue to interpret the way that they've been interpreted in the past, is that we will limit the pool of people that we have available and the expertise that we have in the industry. So I think that we need to revise it so that we encourage more participation, but we certainly encourage more disclosure. And that might be a beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Director Camacho. Any other questions or comments? 
uh, uh, yes, uh, Director Williams. Yeah, yeah I just, I, um, and I don't know, maybe the staff presentation might touch on some of the elements of what that mitigation plan is. I mean, I understand from the staff report that it includes things like physical separation of staff, control of reporting relationships, disassociation of, uh, from other projects, and control of information, and then finally, and importantly, ethics training. Um, I, I, I think it's important to kind of maybe have the record like fully reflect that, and I understand uh, if there's a communication from AECOM um, that, that specifies what that mitigation plan is, that it might be important for the board to actually have that incorporated into the record and the action so that we have accountability for, as a board to be able to also, um, you know, review this um, as appropriate. Okay. I, I think when we get to the point of the action item, uh, or taking that action, uh, Director Williams, if you want to make a recommendation on, on the uh, language that you would like to have inserted into this dra draft uh, resolution. Okay. Yes, Director Shank. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to remind and underscore how we came to this uh, so that the public uh, understands and in, in the interest of transparency that uh, thanks to members of this board, particularly uh, uh, Director Camacho, uh, this came about. Uh, it did not come from the uh, AECOM floor proposal. And I think that there are lessons to be learned here. Uh, there, there wasn't the kind of disclosure, and it took uh, some digging on the part of board members uh, to do this. And uh, I just want to make sure that the record reflects for the public how diligent some of the board members, all of the board members are, but in this particular case, uh, we owe a great credit to uh, Director Camacho for bringing this to our attention, for the staff to be able to deal with it, um, uh, with the respondents, and that we are able to come up with the mitigation that uh, we've come up with. Thank you, Director Shank. Director Camacho? No. Okay, all right. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, then uh, let me uh, turn it over to our CEO for uh, introduction, and uh, we'll start with the presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, I'm proud to introduce Darren Kishiyama, who has headed up uh, much of our work, not only being the oversight manager for the WSP contract uh, to date, but uh, really uh, head of the work that we did with working closely with our council's office uh, on the work in the uh, procurement here for the PDS contract. And just to remind members, we've gone through this before, but the authority is in a bit of a state of transition. We have, when I arrived here in 2018, uh, the authority was structured 30% state staff and about 70% consultant. And we are now, uh, as we sit here today, about 55% state, state staff, 45% consultant. There is no magical proportion that we're looking for. However, we are trying to increase the capacity of the state staff to oversee a project of this magnitude. And we know we need consultant help as we go forward, particularly while we're bringing on resources on the state side. So the contract that is before you is a much more a narrower and targeted contract than the prior uh, contract we had for this kind of service. Uh, it's, it's really directed at uh, program management assistance uh, on elements of the program going forward. And particularly as we extend our, our uh, construction elements from the 119 miles out to Merced and Bakersfield to the 171 mile stretch. So um, it's, it's again, uh, retention of some consultant services, but also in the context of transforming the operation as we improve our own internal state staff capacity uh, and maintain the consultant services where we need uh, the most assistance. And that's really what this is about. Um, and with that, I think I'll just turn it over to Darren. I just say, again, I think the review that was conducted, appreciate the work by the subcommittee on this. I think the review that was conducted showed that uh, the industries are, uh, it's interesting in how it's structured. Uh, there are relationships outside of this contract that uh, uh, are 
in place and, and work on other contracts. It's important that we understand how those relationships work and that they don't in any way infect the work that we do here at the authority. So appreciate the work of the subcommittee on this. And with that, Darren, I'm happy to hand it to you and have you present to the committee. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Darren Kishiyama. I'm the Director of Contract Management. As, oh. Close. Good morning, my name is Darren Kishiyama. I'm the Director of Contract Management. As Mr. Kelly said, I'll be the contract manager for this uh, PDS contract, the Program Delivery Support Contract. Um, so the summary of the request here today is I'm uh, coming to the board with a recommendation to consider providing approval to authorize the Chief Executive Officer to execute a Program Delivery Support Contract, uh, the PDS, with AECOM floor in an amount not to exceed $400 million. Uh, this contract will provide professional services to the authority um, to support both uh, the authority and program management and provide the technical expertise related to the delivery of the program. Next slide. The PDS consultant will be responsible for working closely and cooperatively with the authority um, in the authority's ex executive leadership, financial consultants, and local and state and federal agencies. Uh, they will be responsible for supporting the authority in managing project delivery consultants, including but not limited to regional consultants, design consultants, right-of-way consultants, and environmental consultants. They'll be responsible to provide the expertise to the authority to link program management and construction management to create a singular project controls system that optimizes program management. Next slide. Key authority objectives for the program delivery support uh, contract is really going back to what Mr. Kelly had said related to some of the direction that the authority is moving in, but primarily to assign the appropriate roles for state staff and program delivery support consultant staff. Um, in consistent with the authority's form to function review to ensure that state staff and the consultant staff are assigned the appropriate roles and responsibilities. State staff have been augmented over time, just as Mr. Kelly alluded to earlier to assume roles previously performed by the RDP. Um, so now state staff are performing in a much more broader um, influence over the program. The other objective is to reduce the number of layers uh, between uh, layers and interfaces between the authority and different consultants um, across the authority over time, over the time of the program delivery support contract. The new PDS contract also includes an optional scope element of services to provide the project and construction management services for the current civil works, as well as for future opportunities to utilize those services. Excuse me, Dennis. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, would you, can we ask questions now? Or It's a very long report, and I, I don't want to lose the um, momentum that Dennis has, or De, uh, no. Darren has, but. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Ernie. The, the um, statement you made, the PDS contract will also include at the sole discretion of the authority, uh, project and construction management services for civil work. Um, is that work included into the 400 million not to exceed dollars? Yes, sir. How do we price that out if we don't know what the scope is? The scope of services is roughly estimated upon the services that are currently being provided by the current PCMs. So we took into account the resources that are currently being provided across the various CPs by the PCMs and came up with an estimate based off of the expectations. One of the things that I think several of the committee members have asked is the dollar amount on the civil work yet to be completed. So you're talking about the civil work only on CP 1, 2, 3, and 4? Correct. Is that correct? None of the other that extend beyond that? Currently, that is the intent. Uh, however, depending on how the, pro the authority progresses on the other uh, design services contracts, we may be able to utilize this PCM element if timing works out. So if we move to construction on the future packages, such as the design services for Merced to Madeira and LGA, then perhaps the PCM element will time up and sync up with that work. So how did you break out the $400 million as it relates to the to the civil work, the CM civil work that's going to be done. What was that amount? It's roughly gauging, at, again, going back to what we know of the current CPs and the resources that are currently being provided on those and coming up with a reasonable estimate about over time. You know what that estimate might be? 
It uses roughly between one and a half, two million dollars per month, is, is the rough guess that, that I can recall. I'll have to go back and look at specifically my records if you want a little bit more information. Okay. Since the issue of conflict of interest is, is still on my mind, uh, is it not a conflict then for the PDS to perform CM services as well? We'll have to evaluate that relationship as, as it comes about to know exactly how uh, AECOM floor would plan on staffing that work, recognizing that AECOM floor is the, the party that we're engaging the contract with, but they have a number of subcontracts, subconsultants underneath that seem to have that skill set. I, I would only ask legal counsel to, to look at, at that, and, and if in fact it's going to be at the sole discretion of the authority, that it comes back to the authority, comes back to the board before we implement that that portion of the contract so that we ensure that there is no conflict. Absolutely. Board Member Camacho, we will do that. Thank you. I would just uh, say that I think one of the things that you want, we want to balance the benefits of the proposal against the challenges as well. And I think one of the benefits is one of the things we've uh, had here at the authority over the last several years is uh, an atmosphere of, you know, a, one contractor or one consultant overseeing other consultants and layers of consultants on work that could be better streamlined and managed directly under the authority staff. So the potential to put the, uh, to not have uh, redundant uh, consultant services, but have a more streamlined consultant services under the direct management of the public staff is uh, one of the things that we want to contemplate as we go forward. And again, we can come back to the board to go through the both the benefits and the challenges of this, but that's why we're considering uh, moving to that model going forward. But the, but, the, but the PDS contract, I believe the original thought was to be to run a program, not to run projects, or the CM on projects. I, I just look at, at, at spreading the wealth to other firms uh, that, ex, that have an expertise, and specifically in the CM world, as opposed to the PM world. So it just, it gives them more of an opportunity to bid on work and to be able to benefit from the economic mainstream of all the activity that we've had in construction. I, I have a question. <clears throat> yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Darren, so you're saying that the $400 million includes the money that's going to be paid to AECOM floor for program management as well as uh, there's embedded in there a pot of money for construction management. Yes, ma'am. Now, it's still outstanding as to whether AE Comfloor will do the construction management, right? That's still outstanding? Yes. Which means that there's an option for the construction management portion of it, whatever it is, to be bid out and therefore promote a more competitive environment? If at some point the authority decides not to implement it via the PDS, and then we can de-scope that work potentially, and then go out and do another A&E contract? I just want that on the record. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Second of all, the ne my next question is, um, what about if we run out of money? What about if $400 million is not enough? Are we looking here at a potential change order? And, and by the way, I hate change orders. So for the record, my favorite topic. But is that what we're looking at here? The contract is $400 million for a not to exceed value. So if we did exceed the value of the contract, as well as made any changes to the term of the contract, which is four years, then obviously we would need to have a, a contract amendment, um, not necessarily a change order per se, but this, this would require a contract amendment. And then processing of the amendment would also, similar to the RDP, what we've done to support the transition is we've added money and time to that contract. So. Good. Obviously, we come back to the board for that conversation. Yes. The other thing I'd just say is that this contract is uh, structured to be a four-year contract up to $400 million, not, not required to spend $400 million. The dollars are tied to specific work plans and task orders that we put together and ask the consultant to deliver on behalf of the authority. Um, there is an option in this contract, again, at the board's uh, decision later, whether we want to extend that contract beyond four years to add an additional two years. That's in this contract as well. But again, that's a conversation with the board. And at that time, if we had to add additional money, uh, we could. Again, I think history is important here for context. And one of the things, again, is we consider whether or not to include CM services in there. If we look at historically, 
uh, both CM contracts and the RDP contract has had amendments in the in the past and cost increases over time. What we're trying to do here is is streamline that process a little bit more, have more direct accountability to the authority uh, on the authority's management team uh, going forward. And again, if we uh, run into any circumstances where the contract would require more money, we would come back come back to the board. But there are uh, task orders, work plans, uh, and uh, dollars at risk if they don't perform up to those uh, up to those standards, as well as termination uh, clauses that are in these contracts as well. All right, thank you, Director Shank. Yeah, yes, I see that uh, the question I have you'll cover uh, a little bit later, but I'd like you to keep in mind uh, a, a significant interest in how some of this $400 million, which to me sounds like a lot of money, uh, will also uh, be uh, distributed and included with the minority and women business owners and how, if, if you could, when you get to it, expand how this is going to work so that these funds uh, be, be given an opportunity for uh, not just in the construction management, but actually in the PDS, uh, that we can spread that money to very um, competent and deserving uh, minority and women-owned business firms. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the graphic on this page really shows the uh, scope of work that will be distributed across the the authority uh, described by work plan associated with each one of these functions. So the PDS is responsible for assisting the authority in managing and overseeing the functional components of the program shown on this chart. The scope of the contract covers various functions including strategic delivery, real property, environmental services, infrastructure delivery, engineering services, program controls, capital procurements, and commercial claims oversight, as well as quality, process improvement, and document control, um, as well as What's shown in green is the optional scope element of the PCM services. Next slide. So the procurement process for the PDS services contract was managed directly by authority staff um, as a qualifications-based contract. The procurement was governed by the state's architectural and engineering requirements. The authority proceeded in accordance with the government code, section 4525, and the authority's regulations. Um, Board policies for RFQs and other applicable state and federal requirements. Uh, small business, disadvantaged business enterprises, and disabled vi veteran business enterprises utilization goals were also included as requirements. So we have the 30% SB utilization goal, 10% DBE goal, and 3% DVBE goal. Offers were scored pursuant to the to the following criteria Excuse as well. Excuse me, yes, this ma is where I would ask you oh, please I, to expand I, on that a little bit. I do have a, another section where we talk oh, about specific. Oh, you do, okay, yes, yes. thank you, sorry. So I'll expand on, on it there. Um, so the table here shows the breakdown of how the scoring was weighted. So 60% um, of the score was associated with a statement of qualifications that was submitted by each offer. 40% uh, of the weighted score was based off of the discussion, the results of a, a discussion with each offer and the final score out of 100 points. Uh, next slide. The authority received two statement of qualifications in response to the RFQ for the program delivery support services contract that, that was issued on February 18th. The SOQs were submitted by the following officer, offers. Connect California, which, is comprised of, which was comprised of Bechtel Infrastructure Corporation, Mott McDonald, Michael Baker International, CBRE, Gail Ziedler, Somas, Vanner, and 28 other SB, DBE, or DVBE firms. The second offer was from AECOM Floor Joint Venture, which includes Atlas Technical, Aegis Rail, Turner and Townsend, McMillan Jacobs, and Jacobs Associate, and Jack Heath Consulting, as well as 26 SB, DBE, DVBE firms. Uh, environmental, social, and governance efforts um, which may include environmental sustainability efforts, socioeconomic equity policies, and government governance policies were also included as a pass-fail within this uh, RFQ. Uh, the top two top-ranked offers were invited to discussions with the authority, and the two offers were scored on their discussions using the uh, criteria in the RFQ. Next slide. Final scores were computed following the weighted uh, scoring that was just described in accordance with the RFQ. Each offer ranking is shown on the table below. Um, the information was included 
um, in the notice of proposed award that was posted on June 17th, which was the trigger for a protest period, which is uh, five business days after, and noting that we didn't receive any protests. Uh, the offer is total weighted scores, uh, AECOM floor at 93.59, Connect California at 84.72. Uh, Pre-award reviews were conducted with um, the, the highest ranked offer, which is AECOM floor. Um, so we reviewed information that, that include payroll register, current overhead supporting documents, and, and other direct costs supporting their documentation. Um, at, the authority staff also engaged in successful no negotiations with AECOM floor regarding the terms of the agreement. So going back to an earlier question about um, the conflict of interest, we are including in um, the language of the agreement a conflict mitigation plan with a draft plan due within 30 days of NTP. The conflict mitigation plan, as noted, uh, will dis include discussion of how Ecom floor will implement measures with such as physical separation of staff, control of reporting relationships, disassociation from other projects, and the control of information as well as ethics training. So the last bit on this slide is to talk about the transition between the RDP and the Program Delivery Support Consultant. Elements of the PDS will include a smooth transition from the RDP uh, based upon authority staff experience and feedback from market outreach, the RDP contract will need to be amended for additional time to accomplish the transition for PDS consultant. Uh, so that extension of time takes us to June 30th of 2023. Some RDP scope elements may require a longer transition uh, than it. So that's why we extended the contract out to June 30th of 23, although we expect the bulk of the resources and the bulk of the scope transition to occur within the first three months after NTP. An additional amount um, of 32 million was added to the RDP contract for the current year to fund work through the June 30th, 23. And I would like to take a moment to go back to the small business aspect. Um, so in relation to the SOQ as submitted by AECOM floor, in their statements of the SOQ, they identified the small businesses, the SB, DVB, and DBE firms that will be working with them as subconsultants. And they had committed within the SOQ to exceed the 30% value as normally associated with our contracts. They don't have the complete set of information associated with how the breakdown will be between each one of their subconsultants, but in their initial calculations that they had uh, done prior to submitting the SOQ, they believed and they were confident in uh, the fact that they would exceed the 30% and they stated it in their SOQ. So I, I'll, I'll know more as to the breakdown of how they'll distribute that across the, the various subconsultants as we progress into the contract. Okay, well, yeah, I'd like to get those numbers as yes, you get them. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Uh, the Going back to the work plan and the performance metrics that you're using to award this $20 million, $20 million in award fee, if you want to call it that, uh, I think we touched on it in the last meetings that we had. Um, and, and I applaud you for having for having a portion of the contract to have an award fee type of for performance that is, but perhaps one of the things that that uh, Lynn Shank, uh, Director Shank, has mentioned in terms of the inclusion of small minority disadvantaged and disabled veteran firms uh, participate is that we also put into the metrics for performance that we monitor those goals to see to ensure that they're being monitored and and reward the uh, the uh, acom floor team for for doing a good job that's an incentive that we have as well as we have disincentives by taking away from it when they don't meet it now is that 20 million dollars also included in the 400 million dollars yes sir so if we look at the cm functions we have the construction management as i as i recall may be extended for another two or three years. If we take that amount of money on CP1, 2, 3, and 4, um, how much money is really going to be left for the PDS contractor to perform its function? Uh, and I'm just wondering whether or not we have 
enough money in that contract or or too much money, whatever it is. But I'm not sure um, because we've had we've had uh, dates, and one of the things that that uh, uh, Director Gilmany and I have both talked about is um, when it's going to end, and what is the budget that we have to do this, and it continues to extend. The CM contract CP one, two, three have been our problem child, if you will, uh, with a lot of, of changes, change change orders, uh, extensions of time, which cost money. Uh, whether or not they were um, caused by the the agency or caused by the contractor or just by time, but I'm just concerned about the extension on the C CM contracts that it'll eat up those dollars which were intended. To, which were intended to be part of the $400 million for the PDS contract. So I just want to lay that for the record, my concerns in that area. Understood. And um, speaking to a point made earlier with work plans established associated with the PDS contracts, we are actually able to, uh, with each work plan is an associated budget, so we can make sure that we're operating within the budget as well as uh, track that on a monthly basis. That's how we currently do it with the RDP to make sure that we are not exceeding the value of the contract and so that we can plan for the following work plans as well as scope elements. And we also keep track of that information to assure that we are not really exceeding the expectations of what the contract allows, as well as recognizing that the contract really is an actual cost reimbursement contract. So the services that they provide are what we reimburse for. And so we try to anticipate how those resources will be spread throughout the program. Um, in recognition of that, we try to be mindful of where we are with the overall budget, minus the performance regime, um, keeping track of that associated again to the work plans and then tracking that on a monthly basis to assure that we aren't expending more than what we have planned for on a regular monthly routine. And then uh, speaking to your first point about performance objectives, those are, those are things that the authority intends to incentivize a good uh, partner, especially with a PDS to perform and incentivize them to do the things that the authority finds a good value to. So incentivizing them to perform on a contract management level to support their small businesses is definitely something that we also track and we are currently uh, evaluating on a monthly basis with even the current RDP. Um, Brian, I, I say my questions are, uh, that I'm asking are all in the context that we have a fresh start, if you will, from a new PDS contract with a different scope of work perhaps. Um, and we're trying to transfer from the civil work to, to the uh, track and systems work, which are completely unrelated in many ways. And so I, I want to ensure that the PDS contract has a scope of work that is inclusive of the work that they need to do, because it's going to be a very sophisticated work. It'll be different than what we're doing with civil. But yet we have the remnants of the civil work, which is continuing to, to, to bleed some of our resources that was intended for a PDS contract. So I'm just concerned that we have the right budget so we know up front what we're facing dollar-wise. Yeah. So that we don't come, no one comes back to us saying, well, we didn't include this because, we, because of unintended consequences. So I, I, uh, I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing we're taking time to, to, to think this through and to look at all the what ifs possible. Director Camacho, let me just say that I, I, I appreciate the questions you're asking. I think they're, they're absolutely on point. Remember, we're not making the decision today to move into the, uh, the construction management element of this. It's a service that we wanted to make sure that the, PCM, the PDS contractor was capable of doing. We, we think they have a team that's capable of doing that work. And I think what you just articulated about where we've been in the history of the current structure is why we need to consider change going forward. And so that's why we structured it this way. That way, it's an evaluation we will do as we see the work progress. And we will come back to the board before we make any decision about uh, moving in that direction. But I think for all the reasons that you just explained about the history is the reason we need to consider a different way of doing business going forward. But again, that way we'll come back to the board and talk about before we go down that path. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Go ahead. So the action um, item. Oh. oh. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Nancy, go ahead. I'm, 
I'm sorry. I, I just want to, I, I think what we've said, and, and I want to first of all thank our chair and directors, um, Camacho and Gilmetti, for all their work on the conflict issue. Um, it was a really good decision to delay this issue so that that could get taken care of. And I think some of the issues brought up today about compliance with um, our DBE and disadvantaged and women uh, enterprises and businesses is also good. So what I'm hearing is that in this motion, and I know there's some language maybe coming from Director Williams, we'll have annual compliance with um, the conflict of interest plan to make sure that that is being monitored. Same thing with the target goals on our um, disadvantaged um, and uh, disabled veteran, minority, and women-owned businesses annually. And that finally, the extension would not be granted without coming back to the board. So if, if, can you just confirm that? that? That's kind of what I'm hearing, and I, I, I like all of those things, and I thank my fellow directors for bringing them up. CEO Kelly? Yeah, well, I mean, I, yes, that is, those, those are, those are, each of what you outlined is how we are intending to move forward. Um, and again, uh, we, there will be no extension for the optional two years without coming back to the board. There'll be no going into the CM element of this without talking to the board. Uh, and we do track now uh, on the uh, PD, on the current RDP contract, and we will on this one, the participation rates for all of the small business uh, categorizations. And so we'll, again, be able to report that back to the board routinely. And uh, that's part of what, what we'll do. Finally, the resolution is before the board. will also uh, codifies, if you will, through the resolution, the, uh, the mitigation plan on the conflict issue. Is, is, that, is that going to be reflected in actual language that we're going to include right now in the draft resolution, or is just that's your intent? So, and I apologize because as a former lawmaker, I, I'm never wholly satisfied with just intent language. Absolutely. Um, both uh, to the chairperson and on all, we have resolution language uh, that was added a few days ago at the urging of board members Pena and Gelmetti and it maybe was not in the very first version you received, so if it's okay, I will take a moment to read it. Um, the language that was added to meet this mitigation request was, the chief executive officer or his designee is further directed to require that the AECOM floor joint venture adhere to specific conflict mitigation measures, including, as applicable, physical separation of staff, control of reporting relationships, disassociation from other projects, control of information, and ethics training. So that language is in the resolution we will be voting on uh, when we get to that point, if that is helpful. And as uh, Darren mentioned, also that requirement to adhere to a mitigation plan is in the contract language we, are, we have agreed to with AECOM floor, and the DBE goals are also a requirement in the contract. Madam Council, if I may just add, you know, for, further tease out that section, and that is that, you know, in the world of conflicts, as you well know, conflicts arise when we least expect it. And, and ultimately, conflicts is a way of, of um, allowing for a competitive playing field, but also it's a way of also regulating human behavior. Um, so these conflicts arise when we least expect it. Can we put there some language that ultimately should any conflict arise in the future, the decision lies before the authority and also before you to decide if there's a conflict or not. It's not up to the offeror, it's up to us. I am I correct in that? You are, and we can certainly add that. There is already language in the agreement that at any point uh, a conflict issue comes up, the authority has the right to sort of review staff being proposed, staff already on the project, and can uh, deny that that staff person or that Yeah, as you well know, I'm very jealous of preserving our authority as a board. I also believe that the decision of whether it's a conflict lies inherently in the board. It's not up to the offeror to decide, oh, there's no conflict, therefore I don't have to disclose anything. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. 
You know, you have to, even if you have any doubt, and I'm saying this in public for everybody out there who's listening, if there's any doubt in the future as to whether you have a potential conflict, pick up the phone and call up Alicia. She can give you preliminary opinion as to whether there's a conflict or not. And frankly, I think, you know, for the benefit of everybody in the public, I think you're hearing right now from this board of directors that we would prefer for all of you you know, who are the offerers now or offerers in the future, we would prefer for all of you to err in the side of transparency. Err in the side of letting us know if you think there's a conflict, we'll figure it out, but it's our authority to figure it out. It's not your authority. So if the language is already there, Madam Council, then I, 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 I accept what you're telling me. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you for that direction. Director Williams? Yeah, I just wanted to... I wanted to just um, drill down a little bit on the on the language that that you read, and we do have it in front of us. Um, and, and just a couple of clarifying points to add to that, and, and maybe some suggested tweaks. So, the clarification is that the language that you read requires the, the chief executive officer or, or designee to um, require that they uh, that the uh, AECOM for joint venture adhere to these mitigation measures that you listed. Um, is that requirement pursuant to the terms of the contract? Um, can we include yes. that by reference and, and say required by contract? Yes, we that, can. It is in the contract and we could add that. That's a good okay. idea. Okay. Um, and then secondly, um, I understand that not all of these will be applicable in every situation. These issues might not arise um, so that they're I understand the inclusion of the phrase as applicable, but as I was also mentioned, I'm also concerned that there may be other types of conflicts that may arise that we can't possibly know now, and how do we account for those if this sort of exhaustive list is all we have before us? Um, I, I'm not sure I, I know the solution to how to incorporate that. The fact that there may be other types of conflicts that arise and there may be other mitigation measures that are needed to mitigate that. Um, so, I mean, the, the phrase that we're all accustomed to in the legislative environment is including but not limited to. Um, so if there's a way to include that without it getting too unwieldy in the clauses in this, but, but I, would, I would offer that we reflect that, um, you know, a recognition that there may be other types of measures, mitigation measures that may be needed. We can definitely do that. Yeah, and then yes, the the the, the point that um, Nancy directed that Nancy made about um, reporting back. Um, to, so a suggestion here is in the last uh, resolved clause, uh, where it requires the CEO to report expenditures on a monthly basis. Uh, that we would add and conflict of interest compliance on at least, and I'm just going to throw out an annual basis. I don't think it needs to be more frequently than that, but we should be updated on the progress at least annually on their compliance with conflict of interest. Um, uh, and then um, I think because of uh, you know what I've heard from other board members, I would suggest that we include um, a requirement that the CEO also report to the board on the exercise of additional optional contract services pursuant to the terms of the contract. So we would, prior to the execution of that, um, that contract. Should that option be exercised at some point, that, and I think you said you would do that. So that, that would be my suggestion for, um, for the resolution. And unless there, if the chair would like to entertain a motion, I would, I would make that motion with those additional changes. Thank you. I think what we'll do is, uh, is we, when we have completed the uh, presentation, we may need to take a short recess to oh. allow uh, Alicia to uh, make the appropriate additions in the uh, resolution that uh, have been uh, suggested by the board. And uh, if you wouldn't mind participating no. in that, uh, Director Williams, All I right. appreciate I'm it. Happy to do that. Okay. And, and if I can make one more comment to address a few okay. comments. Our um, conflict of interest policy as it exists is an ongoing uh, requirement on any of our contractors. So it isn't 
we start at the beginning, do you have a conflict or not, and then you come on board and we never talk about it again. Throughout the life of any contract, their responsibility is to come forward. And I will say I, you know, I and our legal group gets emails very often about ongoing conflicts and questions. Certainly we've had them from the current WSP contractor over the years and I anticipate the same will continue on with the PDS. And by virtue of the policy, they all have to adhere to under contract. So it does, it does work um, on an ongoing basis, if that's helpful. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, you, you're on again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the action and staff recommendation is to approve uh, the associated resolution with modifications. Um, which would, in summary, authorize the CEO or designee of the CEO to execute a four-year contract with ACOM floor for up to $400 million and direct the CEO to manage the contract within that budget. The agreement will include a performance-based fee in order to align the PDS consultant's performance with the authority's performance objectives, and that performance regime item is $20 million less than the four hundred. dollars so, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kishiyama. Uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, on the uh, board, any other questions or comments at this moment? If there are none, I'd like to uh, recess for We'll recess for five minutes and then we'll uh, come back to order and look at the resolution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, board is now back in session. All right, uh, the next uh, item on uh, this item number two, or the next, uh, is the revision of the uh, draft resolution, and I'm going to ask our uh, chief counsel to please go through that with the board. Thank you, Board Chair Richard. For the resolution, we won't do anything different to the first sentence which gives the CEO or his designee authorization to execute this contract. But for the second paragraph, we will say, the chief executive officer or his, his designee is further directed to require that the AECOM floor joint venture adhere to specific conflict mitigation measures, including but not limited to, as applicable physical separation of staff, control of reporting relationships, disassociation from other projects, control of information and ethics training as required by the contract. The third paragraph is going to now state, the chief executive officer or his designee is also directed to report the expenditures under the contract on a monthly basis to the board's finance and audit committee and report on conflict of interest compliance and small business compliance to the full board on an annual basis. The CEO, excuse me, the chief executive officer or his designee will also report to the board on execution of additional contract management options under this contract before undertaking that work. All right. Uh, Yes, Director Scusha. What about minority and women-owned businesses? That is part Are of the they included small in the small business? business? All right, Absolutely. as well as disabled-owned. Exactly. Okay, thank yes. you so much yes. for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Okay, Director Williams. Yeah, I would make the motion um, as described um, by uh, Ms. Fowler. Thank you, uh, Director Williams. Is there a second? Second. S second by Director Scusha. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Director Shank. Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. Director Prea? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Escutia? Aye. Director Williams? Aye. Director Pena? Yes. Director Pena? Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion is approved with the amendments. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, uh, colleagues. Yeah, I'm doing it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our co my colleagues, as well as those in the uh, audience or on the phones, 
Um, we are going to um, take out of order items three and four. Uh, item three is a uh, action item and would be more appropriately handled before the information item. So uh, with your indulgence, item four is now item three, and this item will be consider awarding the contract for design services for Central Valley Station. Ms. Cedarroth? Good, Good morning. morning. So thank you, Chair Richard. I appreciate uh, your time and the time of the board this morning. I'd like to go over the design services contract for the Central Valley Stations. This item is under consideration and is a request to the board to approve award and execution of a design services contract for our four Central Valley stations. Next slide. Just a uh, short reminder, these are the four stations. These are the concept designs we've developed for each, and this contract will take those concept designs and move them to a configured footprint. Next slide. Just to recap, um, this is a contract for one designer for all four of the stations, and the solicitation was for comprehensive design services through delivery, which means we sought firms who were qualified to provide final design, construction support, and guide commissioning, as well as do initial concept designs. So we qualified teams for all of the work that we will need, and everything we need really to have functional stations for customer service. We did break the contract into two notices to proceed to conform to our available funding. Notice to proceed number one, the duration is 30 months. That was a result of board discussion in April, which should get us through the configured footprints for each station in 2025, which then we would proceed with final design bid and construction in time with our goal to have customer service by the end of the decade. The not to exceed value for notice to proceed number one is $35.35 million. Next slide. The scope is a logical series of activities that follow a sequence to meet the project's schedule of customer service by the end of the decade. Notice to proceed one specifically focuses on the activities that confirm information necessary for our configured station footprints. The first task order would cover detailed project management, quality management, systems engineering management, and sustainability management plans, among other project administration requirements. The station delivery team is already underway, coordinating with functional areas, including rail delivery, engineering, infrastructure delivery, and other functional areas, all in the service of developing these task orders collaboratively. The other scope items include site analysis, investigation planning, and access for all of the four stations, right-of-way acquisition that's necessary to resolve any design or cost questions, advanced design for all four stations, which will include value engineering and cost estimating, and then site adapting our existing canopy work and configuring that preferred concept and providing the configured drawings. There are many site issues that will be resolved through this design process. This contractor is a critical integrator across multiple contracts that are already or soon to be underway. In Merced, they will coordinate with the M to M alignment designer to integrate the station into the final approved location in Merced. In Bakersfield, similarly, they will integrate the station facilities into the viaduct that carries the trackway to the F Street location. That design work is soon to be underway with the LGA design team that the board recently approved. They will also work collaboratively with the city to finalize design of site access work including improvements that are likely to include modifications to Chester Avenue, Garcet Circle, and State Route 204. In Kings to Larry, they will receive work from the CP23 contractor at the Hanford Viaduct. And in Kings to Larry, this designer will work on the station platforms and site access that must be connected to the existing State Route 43 roundabout and a relocated Lacey Boulevard. In downtown Fresno, this designer will receive the alignment work from CP1 and finalize the integration of this facility into the surrounding urban fabric. And crucially, this designer will integrate their work with the track and systems contractor, or with the track and systems provider. The result will be signature stations for each of the four locations. Next slide. 
In keeping with authority practice, the request for qualifications was managed by staff. Um, as this overview tells you, it included, of course, our small business goals and per our small business particip participation utilization goals. And it also included a pass-fail requirement for ESG efforts, which, of course, as Darren explained, include things like socioeconomic strategies, environmental strategies, and others. And this was also included as a pass-fail requirement here. Next slide. After the board meeting this past April where we received approval, we issued the request for qualifications. This process yielded two qualified bidders, one, a joint venture of Foster and Partners Arup, and the second, Gensler. The offerer teams were assessed based on disclosures and in accordance with the authority's conflict of interest policy, and the SOQs were evaluated and scored by a technical committee according to the criteria in the request for qualifications. We held discussions, otherwise known as interviews, with both of the offerers. Next slide. The final scores are a weighted combination of the statement of qualifications and the discussion scores. Foster and Partners Arab Joint Venture was the top ranked offerer. They provided a cost proposal that was reviewed by the authority as we discussed at this, for this morning's F&A committee and those recommendations that you heard were already taken on board by the contract management team. We successfully negotiated an agreement and are now seeking board approval to execute that agreement. Next slide. To restate the action in front of the board this morning is authorization of the CEO or designee to execute notice to proceed one. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cedaroff. Uh, any questions for, uh, for Ms. Yes, uh, Director Camacho? Or Director Gometti, go ahead, please. I just have a, it's the same comment I always make. 30 months seems like a long time. Is there any way we can cut that back? <laughs> uh, that 30 months takes us through um, to uh, 2025 to get to configured footprint. And we'll be managing very closely to time. So there are certainly stations that are going to be quicker than 30 months. Um, and we certainly have taken on board your advice that we move this design along as expeditiously as possible. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from uh, my colleagues? Uh, seeing none. Yes, please. I'm sorry, I, I do. Um, it, stations are so important going forward for the economic development of the areas, and uh, you know I've seen them literally all over the world. Uh, the, I guess my question is, where along the line will this board be able to see some of these designs as they go along? Will we have any input? Uh, you know, many on the board are experienced in not so much design, but in the reality and the practical aspects of what a, a station can be and do in a community. So I'm just wondering, sort of the. the process here? Are they going to come up with a design and present it to us? Or uh, is there staff input along the way? Is there board input along the way? Yes, this, this is going to be very closely managed by staff and, of course, <laughs> expeditiously managed, as Director Gilmetti reminded us. But there'll be opportunities for the board as well to consider the designs and understand the process. And I'm assuming, I hope correctly, that there will be tremendous sensitivity to uh, not just the, the letter of the ADA law, but the spirit of it as well, so that we have practical uh, applications here on how people with disabilities mm -hmm. access and utilize the stations. Yes, absolutely. I think you speak to an incredibly important criteria for the authority, which is that the stations are universally accessible, which means that um, we take into consideration all a range of different aspects and a range of different um, elements to that access so that they are um, the best stations we can make them. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, uh, we have draft resolution HSR 22-23, approval 
to award contract for design services for Central Valley stations. Uh, I know we have, read, okay, we have a motion for approval. Is that Director Perea? Oh, yeah. And yes, second yes, sir. Director Shank? Uh, please call the roll, uh, Mr. Secretary. Director Shank? Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. <clears throat> Director Prea? Yes. Director Gilnetti? Yes. Director Escutia? Aye. Director Williams? Aye. Director Pena? Yes. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move on to revised item number four, which is uh, the 2022 sustainability report. And Meg, you're still on. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Chair Richard and Vice Chair Miller on the phone, as well as members of the board, I appreciate this opportunity to share a few aspects of this year's sustainability report with you. This year's report focuses not just on our program's process, but it situates it in the wider context of the audacious plans and policies, programs, and regulatory actions of the state of California. Work that they've undertaken to move this, the largest, uh, fifth largest economy in the world, to carbon neutrality as soon as is practicable. It's always a pleasure to share our sustainability progress with the board. Next, oh, no, that worked. Because our achievements in sustainability, the hundreds of activities to advance the ambitious goals and targets that the board has set, reflect the actions of everyone on this program across all functional areas and in all aspects of delivery. And this is a direct manifestation of the board adopted policy for sustainability for the system. You appreciate that sustainability as an umbrella has been intentionally approached at the authority to address social, environmental, and governance factors. These are multiple issues that are all incredibly important. And this report is a consistent presentation of those ESG elements annually in conformance with global standards. California has taken a leadership position for decades to advance critical environmental and social issues. California and its leaders have not shied away from the bold deeds necessary to evolve our economy and its underlying infrastructure, particularly its transportation infrastructure, to not just mitigate, but to adapt and to the rapidly and dramatically changing climate and resulting hazards. The speed and the reliability of high-speed rail, of dedicated passenger rail that runs entirely on renewable energy is, as uh, Secretary Omoshakin noted in his remarks about our report, a game changer in terms of California's climate strategy. The billions of vehicle miles the system saves from our over-congested roadways and the influence that the system has on reducing carbon dioxide emissions, not just in operation, but already in construction and our mitigation practices, illustrates the standard that we are setting. So <laughs> illustrating a system as complex as high-speed rail in construction and operation, and all the ways that the system contributes to both carbon sinks and sources, is essential for regularly illuminating to our stakeholders, including the legislature and the general public, the role that our system plays in meeting the state's carbon targets that are enshrined in code. Now reporting helps us annually to retool our actions and assess our policies. Annually, environmental sustainability topics are important evidence to our delivery teams on the effectiveness of our approaches and it honors our promises with detailed progress reports on restorative mitigation activities. As our policy states, we strive to be a model of sustainable infrastructure. And to that end, our infrastructure delivery teams, our construction management, and our procurement teams have focused on what aspects of delivery, such as equipment, can and should evolve to be most environmentally responsible as well as cost effective. The progress on tier four equipment alone shows the results that are possible when you pay attention to an issue. These practices matter to the communities in which we are building. 
because they are substantially cleaner in terms of local air quality than the alternatives, which are actually still allowable under law. So we've avoided more than 190 metric tons of, of uh, criteria air pollutants. You can also think of that as 420,000 pounds, if you prefer. And our experience with these higher standards for equipment for fleets should position us well to practically tackle the coming revolution in zero emissions vehicles. Our own commitment, which we discussed in April of 2021, mirrors and anticipates the implementation of state regulation to transform the transportation sector to zero emissions by 2035. So the authority board has made very public policy leading commitments to zeroing out criteria air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from construction. And I am very pleased to report that we are still on the positive side of that balance equation. This is due to our partnership with other state agencies, including CAL FIRE and the Department of Conservation. We've leveraged their core competencies in urban greening and habitat and agricultural conservation in order to carry out mitigation. The more our actions in construction avoid emissions, the more the project is delivering on the promise of sustainable infrastructure. One sterling example is our construction recycling requirement. You know, while construction has um, put about 15,000 tons of material into a landfill since the start of construction, our contractors have actually composted almost the same amount and they have reused in construction more than 64,000 tons, which is about four times what we sent to landfill. And then of course, overall, we've recycled 93% of the material from construction. This is an exceptional result. It is unique among projects uh, globally. It's certainly extraordinary for projects in California and the US. California is also unique in its very dedicated approach to climate adaptation. And that was initiated by executive order and then put into legislation. And it has asked us, or infrastructure projects like us, to incorporate climate data and approach adaptation purposefully. So implementation of a purposeful adaptation approach includes work with the authority's enterprise risk management team, who have enthusiastically and rationally incorporated climate considerations into the enterprise risk management plan. And as we've discussed previously with the board, implementation of the entirety of the authority's adaptation plan has also included things such as addressing climate hazards through methodologies and criteria for analysis in design. Sustainability always considers how we meet the needs of today's society without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This is a focus on quality of life for multiple generations. And quality of life often depends upon a very good job. Happily, we have provided more than 8,600 job years, as well as the apprenticeship and the training opportunities at the center in Selma. And these continue to, be de to deliver ladders of opportunity for men and women who want to re-enter and advance within the workforce. Our focus includes applying an equity lens in multiple areas, not least of which in the station planning and the process of learning what the surrounding communities consider most useful and appealing in the station site. These station neighborhoods will interact with the station sites daily. And if we can advance station improvements as quickly as possible to bring more people to the station areas in a positive way, this helps build our ridership. This is all in the service of catalyzing I think we want to go back. There we go. This is all in the service of catalyzing 15 minute communities. And that's a very stylish way of referring to the fact that we are all willing to walk about five to 20 minutes to run an errand, be it drop off a child at daycare or school or pick up groceries or walk to work if our housing is conveniently situated. You know, the uh, catalyzing 15 minute cities is important because this is, helps us to deliver on the promise of high-speed rail. And our post-rod planning activities have explored transit-oriented opportunities, including housing and multi-use developments at the station itself and in the surrounding blocks. The more we work with our partners 
to enable those denser developments, the sooner the promise of the system is delivered. And working with our partners means sitting down with them to co-create solutions and making sure that the broadest relevant community is informed on what is happening on the program. The hundreds of events and open houses help us to know where and how the program is delivering benefits, particularly to disadvantaged communities. In 2021, for example, over 57% of the investment was made in disadvantaged communities, bringing direct income as well as indirect economic activity to it that inspired jobs and economic growth. Over the whole of delivery, that's meant more than $4 billion to disadvantaged communities. That we are intentional in focusing on these benefits speaks not just to the social pillar, but also to governance and how we apply fundamental ethics and values in the delivery of high-speed rail. We will continue to embed social, environmental, and economic considerations into delivery as we advance the service contracts and the capital projects necessary to realizing our goal of customer service by the end of this decade. I think as you've already heard from Darren and myself today, ESG plans and policies are required of consultants and contractors wishing to do work with us. However, there are additional issues that we want to advance, both in our organizational practice and in system delivery. These issues were underscored by the internal and external stakeholders who we surveyed earlier this year in order to understand how we should update or evolve our sustainability plan. Greenhouse gas emissions and meaningfully addressing them across the program continue to be of the highest importance, but transparency and accountability, safety, stakeholder engagement, and the influence of the system on economic development are also areas we must maintain focus in order to honor our stakeholders' priorities. Reporting is a valuable act of transparency. It helps to demonstrate our progress. It reveals to us areas where we can improve and it keeps us organized. I've given you a very quick run through of the sustainability report and the various aspects of sustainability we undertake at the authority. And I will emphasize again, and I hope that you have seen how environmental, social and governance issues are influenced by and implemented by everyone in the authority and that we have all worked to make California high-speed rail a model of sustainable infrastructure. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Megan, uh, for all of that. Uh, congratulations and thank you. Any questions or comments for Megan? Yeah, thank you very much. Great job. Um, if I can, can I ask one question? I'm sorry. Can you hear me, Tom? Yes, right. Um, do you work? Yeah, Meg, do you work with the design team, this new contract we just did, uh, the item before, in terms of, I mean, I'm sure you do, but maybe you could just explain a little bit how that, our sustainability requirements and our design and construction sort of interface and complement each other. Oh, yes, happy to. So, yes, I do work with the design team as well as um, the sustainability requirements, and we've, we've taken... Um, from a from a practical implementation standpoint for facilities that we're building. We've actually embedded high performance design or sustainable design requirements into the design criteria, uh, which all contractors have to follow, including our station designer. Then we've also set very high levels of high performance design for the facilities. The stations will be um, zero net energy in terms of performance. They will be lead platinum facilities, and they are, of course, going to be incredibly water efficient, as well as, you know, reducing sort of critical issues in the area, such as the heat island effect that often arises. I think I heard all of your question, Nancy, but I'm happy to explain. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you again, Meg. We'll now go to the uh, CEO report, uh, CEO Kelly. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, we'll quickly uh, run through the um, CEO report for this month, including a project update report uh, summary, which is an important document that we'll be working on heading into the end of 22 and the beginning of 2023. So let me just jump into this if I could here. Let's see. 
Oops. Oops, there we go. Sorry. Okay. Um, the first element here is that we have, uh, under current law, a project update report that's due to the legislature in every odd numbered year. It's due on March 1st of 2023. And this year's project update report is, whoops, is, um, uh, it's additive over what is normally uh, uh, normally required from the authority. And it's really important that we talk about this because there are elements in the project update report that are due that are uh, important. And I said, as I mentioned, they are um, additive to what's been typically re requested of us in the past. The original project update report was established by the legislature with AB, 1990, uh, AB 95 back in 2015. That required the report to include a summary of the overall progress of our project, current and projected budget by segment, a comparison of the current schedule and budget to the 2012 business plan, summary of the milestones and issues during the prior two-year period, as well as milestones that are expected in the next two-year period, and a thorough discussion of risks to the project and steps taken to mitigate those risks. We will include all of these elements in the project update report uh, that will be due in March. But there is also a series of additional uh, elements that are now required to be as, that, that came as part of the budget agreement in June of 2022. And some of these requirements that are due are issues we've talked about at prior board meetings. And the reason I wanted to talk to the board about them and give you a review of this today is because this is the place we're going to do with a comprehensive update of where this program is as we come into the beginning of 2023, including exactly where we are on cost estimates and schedules. We're required to include our risk assessments and our probability uh, assessments that we are using uh, to describe uh, risk, schedule, cost, budget, all of these things. So this project update report this year uh, includes additional things like uh, making sure that we're uh, updating the completion specifically on the 119 mile dual track segment that we're now in construction on, completion of right-of-way planning, advanced engineering, and stakeholder agreements specifically for the Merced to Bakersfield extensions. I would remind the members that in the budget agreement this year, the legislature said the highest priority for the use of our funding going forward is the implementation, the construction of the Merced to Bakersfield extensions as a dual track system. And so they're asking now, as we do that, we report to them through this project update report exactly where we are and specifically the <coughs> issues. Completion of a funding plan that includes federal funding awards for the Merced to Bakersfield segment and additional milestones required for the completion of the Merced to Bakersfield segment and ultimately the full phase one system. Uh, cost and funding updates are now also to include the cost of the civil works and contract costs for the Merced to Bakersfield segments, the Merced to Bakersfield costs of right-of-way, acquisitions, utilities, third-party agreements, rolling stock and stations, and funding commitments beyond the Merced to Bakersfield segment. Now, as the members know, because of the activities we've taken since the budget bill passed, we have just begun some of the advanced design process on advancing the work to Merced and Bakersfield. You just approved a contract to advance design of the stations. So we'll estimate costs as best as we have them while we're in the early design stages, but that'll be part of what's in this uh, project update report due to the legislature again in March 1st. The other reason I mention this is because while it's due to the legislature on March 1st, I do want to talk to the board uh, about the preparation of this document leading up to March 1st, where we are, what will be coming in this document. When we know more about it specifically where the schedule is, I want the board to know. We'll talk about it publicly. My objective is that by the time we put out a project update report to the legislature, we've covered a lot of the ground at our public hearings leading up to that March 1st date. So again, I wanted to make sure the board knew what was expected of us as we're coming into this March 1st date, uh, and that we'll have continued updates from me in, in terms of where we are and where we're going leading in to that March 1st report. Brian, yeah. will we get a, a draft before that March 1st date? I mean, I'm yeah, I'm gonna, I will lay out the outline for what this looks like now, and there will be, uh, we will work with the board uh, to draft this out before we get to final. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, the theme of the project update report that you'll be hearing is really us getting to operations, the objective of the authority now, and again, the push from the legislature through the Budget Act is to get the 
the uh, Merced to Bakersfield segment in operations. Our goal, as everybody knows, is by the end of the decade, by 2030. And so we're going to lay out this in the project update report, steps for delivering Merced to Bakersfield is a central theme of the report. Our objective, showing the authority's plan to deliver by the end of the decade. Um, we will need help on this. We've been clear that to double track this, we'll need some additional federal help and we are actively working on federal grants. So we'll talk more about that. And as those are awarded, we'll update the board on that and the legislature. Uh, there are uh, updates for Southern California and Northern California regional updates as well. While our priority is building the Central Valley segment, uh, the board members all know, we have investments in the Bay Area, for example, with the electrification of the Caltrain uh, system as an example, the completion of the San Mateo Street uh, or the grade separation that's already done. And in Southern California, as you know, we're partners on the LA Union Station Phase 1 uh, project as well as the Rosecrans Marquardt grade separation. So again, we'll update these things as well. There is a new ridership model with new forecasts, and this is an important element as well. You know, a lot of things happened pre-COVID, then the world changed. And so we have to accept that, we have to look at that, and we have to make uh, new estimates about what our ridership model will look like in a post-COVID world, and we will forecast that. And of course, the ridership model ties to the revenue model. And so these things will also be explicitly reviewed and uh, laid out in the project update report. Of course, there'll be a continued emphasis on the project benefits. As we go forward and we expand this project, uh, the fact of the matter is that economic development will expand, job opportunities will expand. We'll talk about the mobility and the connectivity benefits of what we're doing. And as Meg Seeroth just did so eloquently, uh, we will continue to talk about the climate and sustainability goals as we go forward. Uh, of the quick outline of what that P PUR will look like, the project update report, typically starts with a letter from me to the board and to the public. And then we have the chapter outlines for each chapter. Again, steps to getting to operations in the, in the Central Valley, Merced to Bakersfield, the funding and affordability issues, advancing the work statewide, including Northern and Southern California uh, segments, management of our key issues, and of course, building confidence through risk management. We are implementing a, a much more aggressive risk management program here at the Authority under the directorship of uh, Jamie Matalka and uh, that, that work is underway. There will be appendices that will be part of this, and that is, of course, making sure that we are uh, responsive to the legislative directives here through AB 95, SB 198, uh, both schedule updates and cost and funding updates. So this is all due on March 1st. This is what we're working on in real time. It's really the highest priority for us as a day-to-day -day basis in getting these things solidified and, uh, and uh, nailed down as we, uh, as we go forward. So that's the project update report. Um, I will say now we've, there's been a lot of questions about schedule and I do just want to comment on where we are on schedule. Uh, right now as the board knows and certainly the FNA members know on CP4, we have a completion schedule of that on March 23 and we are still operating on that, uh, working up hard with the contractor and our third party uh, partners to stay on schedule for the March 23 date. Uh, that's important, Ernie, actually because of something you said earlier about where we have CM work ongoing when we bring on the PDS. Uh, CP4 will likely be done for all purposes by the time the, the well, PDS That's the only one on. that is done then, correct? What's that? That's the only one that will be done. It will be at this time. Yeah. As we indicated in the Subdivision D funding plan that the board approved at our last meeting, we have a roughly 20, uh, 2025 estimate for the completions of CP1 and 2-3. We have received a schedule from the contractor on CP1 for that 1225 date. And at CP23, the schedule from the contractor is March 26. We are now applying risk analysis to those, those schedules and we'll finalize those schedules as we go through a negotiation process with the contractor. But that's roughly the timelines on those. Again, consistent with what we had in the subdivision D plan. We should certainly celebrate that, the completion of CP4 when it happens. You know, it is reflective of, of, of an important thing that we've achieved on four and that we're working hard to achieve on one and two, three. And that is full definition of scope in the project. Yeah. Once you have that in place, schedule and cost becomes simpler to talk about. And uh, four, we're able to execute on four because all of that is known and understood. We're working like heck to get the rest of that done for one and two, three, and we'll solidify those schedules. I will say this, one more thing that's really important about the project update report. It will be subject to review by the oncoming or upcoming inspector general's office 
So it's going to be very clear, and my intention is that the one word I want applied to the project update report is credible. It will be a credible document that we will put forward because it's going to go undergo review from others. And uh, I expect uh, to get a clean bill of health when third parties review what we put forward. So that's my commitment to the board and to policymakers, uh, really to the public, that the project update report will be an extremely credible document. I also update the board every month on any change order that is in, in excess of 25 million. Uh, there's two here that I want to talk about today. Uh, one is actually, uh, it's a change order, but really it's about how we move the utilities. Uh, we do this through what's called a provisional sum account. And the provisional sums are dollars we put into a specific account that then is used to move uh, utilities, uh, mostly PG&E and AT&T. Uh, issues. We've su supplemented the account mostly relative to CP1 by 38 million. And again, not all 38 million is necessarily called, but we want the account to be robust as we estimate what it will cost to get to the end of the, the work on this. And so this is here. And then as each task order comes up to move the utility, we release funds from the provisional sum account. So that was an activity that we just undertook to, uh, to adjust the provisional sums so we can get through the rest of the utility uh, relocation work for. Uh, under our current budget. The sweeper package is actually less, again, less of a change or and more of an added scope to the CP1 project, but I want to talk about this for a minute. <clears throat> we have, uh, the sweeper package is a series of works like uh, uh, cable troughs for maintenance purposes, staircases for emergency exits from structures we may have. Originally, this work was not in the CP1 contract, and it was contemplated to be work that would be done by the track and systems contractor. However, the CP1 contractor is already mobilized out at this site, and they already have, and they've already done work related to these facilities. So uh, we made a decision, a management decision, to uh, uh, negotiate with uh, TPZP to add this scope of work to their contract again because they've already done the work on the structures. They're mobilized on the site. We think it's more efficient and the work can be done more quickly by putting the scope back in their, con in their contract rather than waiting for the track and systems contract to be awarded. So we did that and, and that's the second change order here that, uh, that uh, I want to report to the board. Total cost was 63.6 million, but again, we think the benefit of this is advancing this work more quickly and more efficiently without having to get a new team mobilized on the site. Do both of these change orders come out of our contingency fund? Uh, let me look at Brian. Yeah, they do in this case. They do? Yes. Okay. Uh, so that's, those are the updates I had on the uh, change order issues. The uh, next issue is some upcoming activity with industry that I think is important. We are conducting a virtual industry forum uh, to answer questions in the head of what could be upcoming uh, procurements. We have a rail systems engineering services and the CM services for the rail uh, design, build, maintain contracts. These are relative to the track and systems contract. As uh, Director Camacho noted earlier, there's a separate construction management contract that's tied to that. The rail systems engineering services is a contract that was prior performed through the RDP contract, but the specialization here is really on specific high-speed rail operations. So our rail operations uh, firm wanted to break that out from the new PDS and do a specific procurement for that. So we're starting with an industry outreach on this. All of this will come back to the board before we move forward on these. Uh, but the procurements will allow the authority to enter into agreements ultimately for professional services in these areas. The virtual event for the industry feedback and conversations is Monday, October 24th at 11 a.m. And then it will include live Q&A with our rail ops team uh, and the industry. Uh, in addition, uh, we have had, we've undertaken a very, uh, as you know, a very aggressive and active approach to applying for federal funds when they become available. Uh, the federal government did us all a big favor with the enactment of the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA. As we've reported to this board before and we put in our 2022 business plan, as staff, we estimated six different accounts that we think we can play in uh, for under that act. Uh, the total dollars over the next five years in those six account accounts is on the order of $75 billion. So we, every time a new NOFA or NOFO comes out, we look at project <laughs> elements we have and we uh, put forth applications. 
So one, I want to remind the board we have a major application pending on what is called the Mega Grant Program. We have a $1.3 billion application pending for that. That's now at USDOT. Uh, we expect that award to be known by the end of November. Uh, and the second one, which we just submitted, was uh, the Rail Crossing Elimination Grant application. As you all know, we're doing a series of grade separations in the Central Valley, which are great safety projects in an area where the state where there's a lot of dangerous grade separations. And as we look forward to expanding into Bakersfield and Merced, there'll be more grade separations we need to get done. So we applied on October 11th uh, for 67 million in federal funding to contribute to six at-grade crossings in the Shafter area. These are part of the extension of the work into Bakersfield. Uh, this would construct two grade separations and allow us to complete design and right away for four additional grade separations on the path to downtown Bakersfield. Funding would also continue supporting the Central Valley Training Center in Selma. I know that Director uh, Perea uh, talked earlier about the benefits of that workforce development program. We want to continue that program. So our grant application here, I think, requested on the order of $2.8 million for, for the Workforce Center. Um, to be matched by some of our state funds uh, to keep that going uh, much further. And uh, again, the grant is intended to improve the health and safety of these underserved communities in the Central Valley. Uh, one comment I wanted to make uh, also about uh, recent activities of the staff. We, uh, we were invited uh, in September to uh, go to Germany. Uh, the FRA had uh, accepted a panel a uh, position on a panel, and then they could not make it, and we were asked to fill in, if you will. So we brought our director of uh, rail operations as well as uh, our director of uh, sustainability and planning. Uh, we had the opportunity to not just participate on a global panel about high-speed rail and update the international community about where we are in California and what we're doing to advance high-speed rail, but we also had the opportunity, and, and, a, and a thank you to Deutsche Bahn for their staff and the work they did to show us maintenance facilities, uh, how they operate their maintenance facilities, uh, construction tours of on-site uh, construction elements, station tours, which were incredibly impressive. It's hard to uh, explain in words uh, exactly how advanced their stations and train systems are. I can tell you that the Berlin station sees something like 6,000 trains come and go a day and some 300,000 people pass through that station every day. And if you just think about that number, that is more than the totality of all train stations in California combined, and it's one city in Germany. So again, it was impressive to see their stations are more than just train stations, they're really shopping centers as well. Food, retail, other things are involved, and uh, took them you know, decades to get there, and we're trying to get there, but the magnitude of it was, in, was impressive. We also visit, visited their operational control center. Uh, we had an opportunity to meet with the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, uh, and we also met with the German uh, transport minister to talk about uh, what they're doing. You know, I will just share with the board, they too are dealing, had to deal with COVID. Uh, they saw huge dips in ridership when COVID was at its peak, and they did something that uh, they found great success, but now they're figuring out how to extend it, and that was they offered the German government uh, invested two and a half billion euro uh, to offer a single ticket ride for nine euros for a three month period for riders to ride on any any train in their system and they did it for three months nine euros is a bargain uh, for that but it was so wildly popular that now they're figuring out how to extend it but price it correctly so going forward they want to price it but subsidize it less and so they're going through that now but the idea is a single ticket enabling to ride various transit operators. And again, something that is so simple and something that is so much easier for transit riders, wildly popular there, and they're looking to ex extend it. So it was a great opportunity for us to see uh, kind of our future, and it was, uh, it was quite a trip. Uh, with that, members, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for our CEO? Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I do have one question. Um, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Brian. On the um, the decision on the heavy duty maintenance facility, I understand that 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 is now back in play. I just wanted to to make sure that that Fresno and Fresno County is still in the mix in that decision. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to say this, uh, Director Prey, and we can probably talk about this more offline if if that works for you. But I would say that 
As you know, we worked through an agreement with Fresno and Fresno Works some time ago for the location of a maintenance and wave facility that actually had the most economic benefit of all the facilities that we're going to build, as well as a training center and an operational control center uh, in Fresno. And I know in the past the authority had gone out and done a sort of a uh, uh, back and forth with all the communities in the Central Valley about where to locate the heavy maintenance facility. Um, and nine different cities had, had put forth uh, their uh, proposals and hopes that it would be located there. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you my approach to this, and I, and again, we'll have a back and forth with the board on this. Uh, I think the heavy maintenance facility needs to be operated at a location that works best for our operations. And I do not, I don't really want to engage in a sweepstakes with the counties and the cities on this. I think we have to make a decision about where that's going to be located based on the most efficient operations of our system. And that's the recommendation that the staff will bring to the board. And so that's my approach on this. That's what we're working on. And um, that's where I can say it is. Yeah, and that's fine. I mean, that makes absolute sense. Uh, only, my only point is that we not be taken out of the competition until it's, or the decision until it's, we get to the end. But yeah, we can talk more offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, just uh, highlights of uh, the Finance and Audit Committee meeting earlier this morning. Uh, on cash management, we've got uh, the authority um, has about $2 billion in cash. Uh, $1.9 billion of that are cash and, or is cash and trade uh, proceeds. Uh, it does not include the um, the, the $161 million, that's the projected proceeds for the August 17th, 22 auction. The next auction, by the way, is in uh, November 16th for cap and trade. On capital out, our capital outlay budget during the month of August, uh, $98 million was expended, of which $55 million had to do with our design-build contracts. Uh, contingency summary, we they retain right at this point, or this through August, let's say, uh, $2 billion remaining in contingency, of which about a, a billion dollars of, is associated with our CPs, CP1, 2, and 3, and 4. Uh, monthly uh, authorized contingency drawdown was $30 million in the month of August. The construction report um, <clears throat> for the Central Valley structures that with 68 of 93 have been completed. Um, or underway. Uh, that was an increase of one from the prior month. Guideway, 87 out of 190, 19 are either completed or underway. Uh, no change from the prior month. Uh, labor has uh, ticked up, and that is labor on our jo day jobs. Average daily labor has uh, rose uh, to 1,188 per day. That's an increase of 75 over the previous month. Uh, utility uh, relocation, 10 relocations in the month of August um, of 22. That uh, brings us to 880 out of 1,863 have been completed. 372 are in progress, 64 have been approved, and 547 have not started at this point, at this point meaning August 31st. And right away, 10 parcels were delivered <clears throat> in, tw in August. That brings us to 2,125 out of 2,321, or 93% of the right-of-way parcels have been, uh, have been secured. Uh, with that, unless there's any questions from my colleagues, uh, let me just uh, let you know that we'll add one um, item uh, to our agenda today, not to the agenda today, but we want to let the board members know that um, at the end of each meeting, if you have anything that you would like to be agendized for the next meeting, uh, or it may not make the next meeting depending upon the agenda, but it would be agendized as soon as possible, uh, at the end of each meeting and before a closed session, we'll ask uh, the board members if any member would like to have anything added to a future agenda. Okay. So, well, I... Um, I don't take credit for that. I have some really good colleagues who have suggested it, but I, I absolutely agree with it. So I don't know if anybody would like to have something added to. Yes, Ernie. To help us with some of the issues we've been dealing with, it might be helpful if we could agendize for the near future a list of all the contracts that are coming up. Um, 
We have tracking systems. We have CM on those. But other, tra other related contracts that could have an impact on our conflict of interest issues so we can get ahead of them. So if we can get a, a, a preview of perhaps the next six months contracts coming up or even if they could go further out, that would even be more, more useful. But at least the next six months, that would be helpful. Thank you, Ernie. Any other uh, questions or comments today? All right. Well, uh, as our, as the board members know, we have a closed session. Uh, for those of you in the public, we're going to move into closed session, and I'll return after closed session uh, to close this meeting and to report anything that uh, is required to be reported. So uh, we are in uh, closed session, and we'll see you shortly. We think that might be somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. We're ready. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've completed our recess. Uh, the board uh, completed uh, its closed session, and we have uh, nothing to report. And so with that, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, this month. We'll see you next month. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>